Hello guys, uh, welcome back to book club. I'm very excited to be back with um, book club this week and I have Cammie joining me and I've been wanting to do a book club with Cammie for a very long time so I'm very excited that we were able to choose a book and work it out this week. Um, we chose What Red Was by Rosie Price. Rosie Price was only 26 actually when she wrote this book and it was her debut novel. I feel like we've done so many debut novels, but big fan of the debut novel. Um, and she said it's a story she wants to relate to all women who have suffered at the hands of men, which unfortunately there are many. And um, it's unapologetic in its mission to depict, analyze, and shed light on the trauma of rape and its aftermath. Um, you know, it's about power, privilege, consent, and also dissects the effects on your mind and body. Uh, it's about Kate Quayley, who goes to college and is having a difficult time making friends when she meets Max. They quickly become friends, um, they bond over films. Max's mom is a film director who Kate is a big fan of. Um, so it kind of follows their platonic relationship as a male and a female being friends. Shocker, it can happen. Um, and you know when that relationship is compromised because a member of Max's family sexually assaults Kate at a summer party. Um, I want to reference the opening quote because I just think it describes rape uh, in a way that kind of makes it more understanding that doesn't only focus just on the incident itself but how it can affect you long term. Um, so it says, it was not the attack in isolation, but what it did afterwards. The way it shattered perception, distorted senses, disabled the ability to trust and love and be loved, drained the world of color and light. Um, you know, something Rosie has said in an interview, which I thought was really interesting. She said, a classic symptom of post-traumatic stress is the compulsion to recreate the traumatic event over and over whether it is the abuse survivor returning to a violent relationship or the soldier returning to a war zone. Now, this is depicted a lot in the book because Kate kind of, in the months following the incident, is replaying it in her mind over and over. Um, and I do think that is a common thing that can happen in the aftermath of sexual assault. Um, you know, I do want to note that this story is inspired by true events, but it's argued that there is a danger in fictionalizing sexual assault. I know it was the same in my dark Vanessa, so I always like to preface um, just that sometimes it can separate the experience from the human and it distances the facts from occurring in reality. So I just want to really stress that when it comes to assault, it's really important that we do support and amplify the soldier or sorry, amplify just I think the the reality of it, that it does happen in real life. It should not be fictionalized and separated, that this is a real event that um, unfortunately happens commonly. So um, the author has been open about being raped um, and she wrote this book as a somewhat therapy to her. I do think also in, in telling these stories, it is sometimes easier to fictionalize it first um, to be able to separate yourself. And if that was um, Rosie's way of coping, I absolutely think that that is a very valid way to cope when it comes to something like this. Um, I do want to say a warning for those who haven't read the book yet. The assault scene was described in extreme detail, so please be aware if that is something that is triggering for you. Be cautious of that when reading the book because um, it is very difficult to read, especially those parts. Um, now, before I bring on Cammie, I have to just tell you guys how much I love Cammie because she recently, I think over the summer, has gotten very into reading and has been even recommending me books, which I love. I always want a good book recommendation. So I'm really excited that Cammie is a book enthusiast like myself too. Um, and she recommended this book. So I would love to bring Cammie on here so we can talk about it. Hi. Am I on? Oh yeah, you're God. on. I've never been on this. Welcome. Well, I, I think the last time I did a live was like three years ago, and I'm leaning against my computer, so tell me if it sounds terrible. No, no, you're good. You're Okay. You're a professional. Hi. 
<laughs> Thanks for having me on your book club. I'm happy to have you. We have you to come up with a name for your book club. I know. Like I know. KBC, Kaya's book club. Okay. Something like that. A work in progress. We can think yeah. about it a little more. No, yeah. More. We'll keep brainstorming. But we yeah. can think about it a little more. Um, <laughs> thanks for the introduction. I really liked everything you said. Um, I am very inspired by your book club because I've actually read four of the books that you've told uh, your followers to read. And... I have actually, I'm not as good of a reader as you are. You've been reading for years, but I just got into reading pretty much in quarantine. I hadn't read a book start to finish in 10 years since like mm -hmm. the Twilight Saga. Cause I just feel like I'm always reading scripts and right. I'm not reading a script. The last thing I want to do is like pick up and read more. I just want to get off my computer or get out of my room. So I actually, you told me to read Normal People in quarantine, which I did, <laughs> and My Dark Vanessa, which we were just talking about, which ended up being one of my favorite books, and mm -hmm. Where the Crawdads Sing, and all the books that you've told me to read, and I've fallen in love with reading, and I think I've read like 20 books now in quarantine, so I think I'm like That's on my awesome. way to becoming- I think you might be ahead of me, actually. I think I'm like on my way to becoming a reader. So I'm really You're excited. not on your way, Cammie. You are a reader. Well, it was just hard for me to find a book. Like, whenever I would pick up a book in the past couple of years, I'd start it. And then if I wasn't into it, I'd put it down. And then I would just yeah. never pick it up again. So I just think it takes finding a book or a subject that you really, really like. Mm -hmm. um, I realize that I have to, like, be intrigued with the book in the first 20, 30 pages. Or else I'd put it right. down and I'd never pick it up again. Right. And but I also now think school can kind of give you a negative connotation with reading because yes. you're forced to read books that you don't want. And so I was just saying no when I finished school, I did yeah. not read for a very long time. And then I realized, oh, you can choose the topics. And if you don't like a book, you don't necessarily have to finish it. I am someone that does have to finish it. I have but to you find, it no matter what. I know, but I'm you do like, find, you do find kind of the genres that intrigue you and you can stick with that. And so I'm very happy I think it's here. I think it's so true because I, I read, we were all forced to read so many books in school. And it's like, mm -hmm. now that I'm, I found the genre and the type of reading and writing that I like. And now I'm just like exploring all the books that are recommended to me through you, through other book clubs. This one was actually recommended by Bellatrist. Um, I have to shout out Emma Roberts for telling me that this book was amazing. So shout out to Emma. And I'm really happy we chose this book because I really thoroughly enjoyed it, even though it's such a dark subject. As it you know, yes. as all the readers who have read this and the people that are yet to read this. And I think it's good that you disclosed, you know, that it can be uh, triggering for people uh, who have experienced sexual harassment or sexual abuse. And also people, I think something that we should talk about is that if you're planning on reading this book, it definitely does get into the world of self-harm, which mm -hmm. I think can be also triggering because the scenes of... Kate Cutting can be very detailed and descriptive yeah. and I think that it could be triggering for people who have dealt with that in the past or are still dealing with that in the past yeah. so and as people know who have been a part of my book club I don't tend to choose light topics uh, yeah um, I don't really seem to like light books either I like my dark Vanessa where things go terribly yeah. wrong it's but drama sometimes it's, it's easier yeah. to then talk about things that are normally hard to talk about when they are presented in literature um and it kind of forces those conversations to happen. So yeah. I'm very happy that you recommended this book because there are a Let's lot of- Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, I do want to start just because that was kind of like the main theme is sexual abuse and ownership yeah. of the experience. Like Kate, I feel like for a long time, she stays very silent about the experience um, because she wants to have ownership of her own personal experience with it. Right. And, you know, the scene of the assault, it is very explicit, but it's not necessarily violent. And I think that's a very mm -hmm. important depiction of a certain type of sexual abuse that can happen because um, it makes it disturbing in its own way. So she kind of hopes people will see something is wrong with her and ask her, but she doesn't necessarily want to start the conversation. I think that's something important to talk about is that it's difficult to be the first one to bring it up when you have experienced something like this. I think it's also, um, it's interesting because Kate leaves little like crumb trails where she wants people to ask her, but then when they do, she shuts down and she doesn't answer the question. Right. So it's like Max will ask her, you know, everything, but you know, who the person is and she'll say, she'll get close to being able to say it's Lewis and she'll say, it's a stranger. It, I will never mm -hmm. see him again in my life. So mm -hmm. it's like, she, she kind of wants people to ask, but I feel like when they do come close, she just retreats and it's, and then gets afraid because it's like this thing that she'll no longer be able to control and own and it be her private um, 
private experience and it's then in the hands of someone else to make what they want of it. And she even said this quote, I don't remember what point in the book it is, but it was, you know, once that experience is no longer mine, the, the fear of someone else not believing it mm -hmm. is just too great to mm -hmm. bear. So she would rather carry this on her chest for years right. than open up to someone and even have that conversation. So I just think it's so interesting always to read how different survivors deal with sexual abuse and, and rape, you know, the word that they don't want to use throughout yeah. the book. We just can't stand to hear that word, but it is what it was. Yeah. So and I just think it's interesting how everyone deals with things differently. Like in the writer having to write this book was her therapy. I don't think Kate would have mm -hmm. ever been able to sit down and write this. It's like just people cope with trauma in such different ways. And I always find it interesting to see how different people cope with different yeah. things. And I think this depicts a very accurate um, and real way that a lot of people do deal with trauma. Yeah. Like this. And do you think, you know, this idea of, of Kate losing control of her traumatic experience is true in real life? Do you, do you feel like that is, you know, something that a lot of women who are rape survivors deal with when um, having trouble with, you know, coming out and telling people that this has happened to them? I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for rape survivors. I couldn't personally relate to Kate's experience because that's mm -hmm. just not my life experience. But that didn't take away from the fact that I felt everything that she felt just because the writer did, Rosie did such a great job at portraying the physical sensation of what it feels like after you just get raped and cleaning up her body and the way she looked at herself in the mirror and the icy hot feeling that comes up to her chest every time she recalls it, it really can take someone who has not had that experience, has been fortunate enough to not experience that and make them come as close as they can to understanding mm -hmm. because you will never understand. Absolutely. And that's the truth. You, you know, you can try, you can listen, but you'll never understand what that person's been through. So I think she did, does a really good job at, throughout the whole story making you feel for her. But it's hard because I'm such a, a, a vocal person. I think you are too. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to imagine yourself in that situation, how you wouldn't get out and call your mom right away. And that's just not right. how everyone deals with, with trauma. Absolutely. And this whole idea of she did say no, but she wasn't screaming and she yeah. wasn't fighting. But you, no one can say mm -hmm. how you're going to react in those situations. And that exactly. does not make it okay, you know. I've definitely thought about that as a woman. I think yeah, you must have too. And I think women in general do think about what if this were to happen to me? And I think you have an idea of, oh, if I were uh, you know, to be attacked or to be raped, I would kick and scream and bite. And then the reality of what happens in a circumstance, the way your body can shut down, the way you can just totally go blank. And that's another mm -hmm. way of coping with trauma and coping with what's happening. I mean, she said that quote, which you referenced, I think, or there was a quote somewhere in there that I had written down that was beautiful. And it's how she left her body in that moment. Right. There's so many different ways that you can react to something crazy and volatile and horrible happening to you. So there's no way to know what you would do in that circumstance. But I think as a woman, we all kind of think that we'd like, we like to think that right. we'd be the brave, strong person, but it's not always how it comes out and that's okay. Yeah. And how do you feel? Cause I know you've, as an actress, it's a very different depiction, but you have been in, you know, very explicit scenes. And, um, and I think in writing, it's a bit different when you're when you really read something, because I'm sure when you're reading scripts, and there is a description of rape or of sexual assault, or something mm -hmm. like that, it is but you are very taken aback by it. Um, so how do you feel about sexual abuse being represented graphically in literature? I don't think I've ever read a script that was so detailed in the way that this novel was they just don't have the time in a script in a 120 right. page or 100 page script they don't have the time to make this kind of scene so detailed and so strong and so powerful or else the scene would yeah. go on for 45 minutes and nobody wants to see that because so, all of those feelings are happening within kate's head and i think yeah that might get lost yeah and it, and also they just can't spend that much time talking about you know the exact moment and in a way that you have a 300 whatever 16 page novel like this is you have time to really get into the depth of what life looks like after what life looked like before i think rose did a really good job at showing what kate's life was like before mm -hmm. the incident before the rupture in her young adulthood and um yeah i've never quite read a script that had this much detail but i just found it so interesting because the way that the, she described the physicality and the senses and the flashbacks and 
how when she dropped, you know, the glass Tupperware and she, her, she saw red blood, that is a trigger. And the amount of triggers, I wasn't educated as to how mm -hmm. many things throughout a day can trigger a survivor Absolutely. and bring it back to that memory. Absolutely. And I think the way that um, Rosie is able to depict in such detail um, the emotional effects and the aftermath of it mm -hmm. can actually feel like she's standing in solidarity with a lot of these women and she is you know someone who has been sexually assaulted before as well so do you think a book like this can be comforting or cautionary for women do i think it can be i, I actually thought about that i didn't know that you would be asking that question but i thought about this because i wanted to say you know caution anyone who's experienced something like this this book could be really hard for you to read but it also could be really comforting for someone to read mm -hmm. who is a survivor of sexual assault because i'm not saying it's going to be one thing or the other i can't say how someone will react but i do see how it could be comforting to know that someone else has had the same feelings and the same right. physicality and the same flashbacks and the same hard time talking about it and the same feeling of guilt and shame and i think it Someone who read this could go either way. It could be super triggering or it could be actually very healing to feel that they're not alone in everything mm -hmm. that they felt. Yeah, I, and I agree. I think it's, um, it's important to know that you're not alone in, in whatever emotions that you're experiencing after. I you know everyone has their own very individual way of coping and ex individual experiences and mm -hmm. no one's to say how someone else will react. But I think to understand that it, it doesn't, it doesn't make you not normal to be feeling these things after to ha be having it affect every part of your life after that is a very right. valid thing that can happen so I'm sure you know um by reading this at least women can understand that this is something that a lot of women go through in the aftermath yeah and I think I mean I, I don't know about you but just to lighten up the subject a little bit I was so happy in the last 30 pages when everyone mm -hmm. found out that it was Lewis I mean oh, me too. I wanted it was I, just, sad. I wanted it to happen yeah so much early on I was dying for someone to just put the pieces together it was I so think. obvious because I think also you know Kate wasn't ready to admit that she really did want to tell people yeah. but she was like you said dropping those breadcrumbs and you really just wanted to grab the people and be like push her harder or like but I again you I was know, like ask her one more time are you but sure it's at no the one same that, time no, someone it's like, ask her yeah but at the same time it all will come in in time and um yeah. and at her own pace and it's absolutely her story to tell um I actually didn't know that they were going to, I actually, by page 250 was like, no one's ever going to find out and mm -hmm. Lewis is going to die with the secret. And so is Kate. And yeah. that made me frustrated, obviously, because I wanted Lewis to have to be held accountable by his family or by the law or whoever it is. Absolutely. Um, so I was getting frustrated because I was like, I really hope this book doesn't end and Lewis just gets to get away with this for the rest of his life. hundred percent. And I also think, mm -hmm. you know, there is a danger in staying silent when this could happen to other victims. Right, and, and so that's what Zara said. A big, yeah, and a big part, you know, and Zara also said, careful who you tell, but then she kind of mm -hmm. followed up with, but you have to think about if this person is harming other people, right. you know, you, you do feel a sense of responsibility um, for, you know, naming them and holding them accountable for their actions. It's interesting because Kate didn't see it that way. And she said, I think she said something like, it's not my problem. Not my, yeah. Yeah, it's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Which is an interesting reaction. It's not right or wrong, but I understand Zara's point in having been a rape survivor herself to try and say, hey, you know, I wish I could have gone back and done it differently. Because I think there's a point right. in where Zara's rape survivor is dead and she has, she basically buried that with him and she was never mm -hmm. able to confront him or, you know, hold him right. accountable for what he did. And I think there's a little bit of like a, you know, a sense of regret of not having done something when she, he was alive, when she had the opportunity. And there also is something in, in, you know, having this experience happen with someone that you do know and someone that is right. still then around you. Um, you know, this is someone that Kate has to face quite often. Mm -hmm. And um, and that is a completely different, you know, part of sexual assault is when you know your abuser um, and then have to face them. And Kate is constantly afraid every second of every day that she's going to see this person and that right. you know he's going to harm her again and I think with Zara having her abuser be dead it's not something that is constantly on her mind um, right you know obviously the the trauma of it doesn't go away but I think that fear that he's going to do it again um has lifted from her I think it's also 
nice to see Zara, who is, you know, whatever, 20 or 30 years older than Kate. Mm -hmm. This happened to her when she was 19, so around the same age as Kate. And to see how she's been able to have a family and a successful work mm -hmm. life and a husband, to see that you can recover from these situations, you can live a full life, you can mm -hmm. heal, you can go to therapy. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. So it's kind of like Zara is a representation of what Kate can be if she continues yeah, yeah. to heal and work on herself. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, I mean, to happen, for that to happen to you at 19 or like it did at Kate in her early 20s, it's, it's a rupture in like some of the most important developmental years of your life, if you look Absolutely. at it from a therapist standpoint. Absolutely. And I think when Kate says, you know, everything is kind of like before this event and after this mm -hmm. event. And it is yeah. a very, yeah, it's a, it's a colossal thing to happen. And um, to m then measure your life in before and after this horrible thing that happened to her, it definitely feels very earth shattering. Um, and you feel so much for Kate, you know, being able to meet and get to know her before and then to see how she changes afterwards. It definitely, right. as a reader, you, you're heartbroken alongside her because you see how it really does affect her mood. She gets depressed, she starts self-harming and um, yeah. and yeah, but then you also see through therapy how she begins to get better and better, which is also, it, there is faith in this book. Do you think, I have a question for you, do you think that Lewis really doesn't think that that was not consensual? You know, it's interesting. I can't because tell I like, because I couldn't tell. Yeah, I feel like in That's most books, surrounding this issue including in my dark vanessa you don't hear um the perspective of the abuser so when the right. you know when you're talking about lewis you're actually thinking his thoughts as well where so it was interesting because you hear him kind of in his own mind justifying it being like mm -hmm. i knew that she wanted it even though she said no but that is just in reality not something that is ever okay like yeah. consent is so important and the word no means no she also said um, I, I don't want to fuck you yeah in in exact words so i think in exact even words, if like so. it's they didn't know each other they well they didn't it's just completely he heard those words and did it anyways so even however he wants to justify it in his own mind yeah i think he does know that it was not consensual um very clearly because i but i mean kate made it literally it was so black and white she yeah, said yeah. no i don't want to and do then it. he even said that after he did he said i know what kind of girl you are you want to pretend that you don't like it but you really do and that's as if not that's his decision. right yeah as if that's his decision or right no. to be able to say what kate does want and what she doesn't want and how she's yeah. pretending she doesn't want it but she secretly does it's just not yeah it's not his decision to make her consent is her consent not he does mm -hmm. not get to decide and so i think you know it's interesting to hear his standpoint on it because normally you don't get to hear the thoughts of the abuser right um kind of the villain in all of this uh mm -hmm. but i even in reading i think it's his way of trying to justify it but i do believe that he knows i did like this english sense of humor that comes out throughout the story because mm -hmm. i feel like with normal people and a book that we both love conversations with friends mm -hmm. like one of our favorite books there's mm -hmm. such a thing in although they're irish it's kind of like the, all they all have that dry sense of humor yeah that sort of that sarcasm I, and yeah and i and it reminded me a lot of normal people in the me sense too. that like i know we were texting about this being like this is this normal people in the first Are hundred connell pages? and marianne <laughs> it's connell and marianne but i think it's the opposite because i think mm -hmm. max is marianne in terms of like being the upper class, class wealthier yeah. and your family looks put together but is secretly falling apart right and i think that kate is more like connell with the single single struggling mother you know lower financial class and it's interesting because both of those authors made a really big point to talk about the financial class distinctions it's a huge like, underlying theme in this yeah um, they bring it up a lot in this they bring it up a lot in normal people it's like one of the the bigger things mm -hmm. uh so i thought that was interesting and i also what i really liked about both normal people and this was that it was this one was platonic between kate mm -hmm. and max but they're both just really beautiful friendships like marianne and connell mm -hmm. their relationship started based on having like a really good healthy friendship right which i really like is two young college kids this is two young college kids and i throw out the whole point of the whole story they're so, gonna end up together not, they have to, but right. I love that they didn't do it. Because and that literally is perfect for my next question for you. Um, because yeah. I was saying like, 
they do have a strong relationship. And when I yeah. started reading it, it reminded me so much of normal people. So yeah. in my mind, I was like, Max and Kate must end up together. And when they actually ended up keeping it platonic and did not end up together, I kind of had to check myself too, because I was like, I'm one of those people that assumes that men and women cannot have platonic friendships. And I kind of, I was kind of glad actually to see that they could stay in a very strong relationship with each other and continue being platonic. And I wanted to ask you if you were also happy that they ended up staying platonic or did you kind of want them to end up together? I mean, the like romance, yeah. corny cheese version of this book would be like they fall in love and end up happily ever after, which of course I'm always for. <laughs> but, um, but I was actually really happy to see a book where it wasn't like the cliche ending yeah. where they end up happily ever after. And to show that it is 100% fully possible for a man and a woman to have a friendship that is platonic and that they just really love each other. But I think Max and Kate are in love, but they're in love in like, you're my soulmate. I don't want to physically be with you mm -hmm. in this life, but like no one in life will ever understand me better than you do. Yeah. But I think that at some point between a male and female friendship, there is just happens to be usually one person in the friendship that mm -hmm. would want it to be more, whether that's a phase and it comes mm -hmm. and goes. But there's always someone who at some point is sexually attracted to the best friend or to the or vice. The guy's attracted to the girl, the girl's attracted to the guy. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything happens, but I definitely think in male and female dynamic, there's always someone who would allow it to happen if it started happening. Right. And, you know I, and I mean? I, even when Kate is, she describes missing Max and she's like, yes, I miss Andrew, her boyfriend at the time, mm -hmm. physically, but like with Max, it's like, I could almost cry at any point that he's not yeah. here. And that Max is her soulmate. He fulfills right. her in a way that Andrew doesn't. And he'll right. never, I don't think Andrew will ever understand Kate in the way that Max does. No. No. But I, I, I want, like, a best friend like that. I would mm -hmm. love to have a male best friend who mm -hmm. is my soulmate and, you know, I, I nothing ever happens. It's platonic. I mean, I actually, I do have a couple, most of my male best friends are gay, so I guess that wouldn't happen anyway. But who knows? Yeah. And I also think uh, the fact that they can remain friends, despite this, like, underlying theme of class. Um, so I want to talk about that. Like, how do you think class played a role in this story especially in in Kate's you know um staying silent I think that that was a very intimidating family to come out against not just because they were wealthier but because the mother is so successful mm -hmm. and the brothers are so tight-knit and even you know William is having a hard time at the end believing that Lewis did it even though everyone in his family is saying mm -hmm. they did so I don't know I just think it would be intimidating to come out period mm -hmm. and it is a family that she's very close to regardless of class and she um, said the only reason she really doesn't come out is to preserve her relationship with Max mm -hmm. like that's how much she loves this person she would rather hold a secret carry the burden for two three years have anxiety attacks panic attacks cut herself than risk the potential of ruining this relationship with her best friend which i i think is beautiful i don't know if it necessarily was the healthiest choice i'm, I'm not going to judge that but um i don't know i would think it's scary to come out period i think it's terrifying to come out terrifying to come out and say your best friend's cousin raped you in a party in his house at his mm -hmm. in his mother's bed and she's now close with nicole she's now close with zara um but i do love zara zara is kind of like just the most amazing i think kind of mother figure to, she's more of a mother figure than Allison is. Yeah, Kate. absolutely. And that's, and I was very grateful. Very I was grateful that um, Kate had, she could kind of find comfort in Zara and yeah. um, solidarity and that Zara encouraged her to get help, especially, you know, uh, getting into the issue of self-harm, which was definitely a very difficult part for me to read um, mm -hmm. the way that it's depicted so realistically. And um, there's a quote that says she pressed down on the glass, pushing it through the soft skin on her thigh, dragging it in a swift line. Only when blood began to beat on the glass's sharp edge did she exhale. So this was shown in a way as a coping mechanism, yeah. um, but also as a side effect, a side effect and a result of dealing with trauma. Um, you know, how, what was your reaction? Because I think part of 
it's not always something that's discussed as a reaction or a way of coping with yeah. a traumatic experience. So how is it for you reading this, realizing that this is sometimes part of people's coping mechanism? I don't know about you, but when I was 13, 14, and kind of entering high school, a couple of my girlfriends, all in the matter of a year of like becoming young women, all a couple of them started cutting themselves and self-harming. And I remember two friends distinctly that I remember just being totally freaked out at 13, 14, not knowing how to handle that. And it's interesting because when they tried to describe why they did it to me and I asked them and I was crying and I was telling them to please stop and that I was going to tell their parents I needed help. I mean, I was only 13, 14 dealing with that. But it's interesting because I feel like that's the age that young women start to experiment with anorexia, bulimia, body dysmorphia, mm -hmm. self-harm, cutting, drugs. Um, it was just so interesting to hear the reason that they did it and the physical release of pain mm -hmm. that it gave them. Um, and it was just hard for them to see that, that that wasn't the right way to do it, that that wasn't uh, sustainable and had longevity. Like that is not how you can live for the rest of your life in order to right. feel like pain, you have to create a wound on your body. So um, it was really so descriptive in this book. I mean, I was, I never understood it like I did in what <laughs> Red was. Yeah, and I think it gives you the perspective that, you know, sometimes the manifestation of emotional pain and emotional trauma is um, more palpable, more just to the point uh, when it is, you know, translated into physical pain. And I think um, for Kate, it was a control thing. It was something that she could place in the moment rather than this deep trauma of the experience that she had had with Lewis. Right. Well, that's what I think when you say like, that's a control thing. It's also what anorexia is. It's also mm -hmm. what bulimia is, being able Absolutely. to control what comes in and out of your body. Um, and also when I've spoken to my friends that deal with those kinds of disorders, it's all a OCD. It's all a matter of being in control. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was just Kate's only way, her only knowledgeable way of dealing with it. And even for like the moment that she didn't feel anything, mm -hmm. all that pain was worth just that one second that when, the, you know, the blade hit right. her skin, the only thing. But I don't want to glorify or glamorize that, no. you know, and I don't think that she does in the book. So I no, just I think it, I think actually not talking it, about it in a positive No, and I think way. the, the, ex, the, how explicit it is in the book is a very just straight to the point of how horrible self-harm can be, how destructive it can be. And, you know, even Kate is ashamed of the cuts on her legs and, um, and, and is trying to Andrew never that. sees the cuts or he just doesn't want to ask? Cause I think she I kind of explains that it's just something that he doesn't bring up because he asks about it occasionally and she'll make up really bullshit excuses. Yeah, like she ran into something. That she, that she even knows are not something that anyone would buy. Right. But I also think, you know, that is maybe somewhere that Andrew didn't want to overstep, but also probably should have been more adamant on helping her because he was kind of just silent and said, okay, if that's what you say. That's and what I, I do everyone think it's important. Yeah, everyone when, when you see for. someone in your life struggling, you know, sometimes people don't speak up because they're afraid it's going to be uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. these are the conversations that can actually save someone's life. And Absolutely. I do think it's very important to be very aware of the people around you their mental state, their physical state. You know, she gets really skinny as well, which is another control thing. Yeah, and Nicole and everyone's telling her, you look great. You look yeah. really good. And I do think it, it seems, it's very insensitive um, to just kind of nod and say, okay, when you know someone is not. Right. Um, you know, not to say that you should push, but I definitely do think that the people surrounding her, you know, Zara did push her and, um, and it ended yeah. up really helping when she went to therapy. And I do think Andrew, as her boyfriend, you know, you wanna be there for someone, but you also really wanna help them when you see someone struggling, you should definitely, I think it's important, even though it's uncomfortable to speak up. I think that everyone in this book could have spoken up more, could have asked more questions. You know, again, you mm -hmm. don't know how you'll deal with it. I feel like I'm a very vocal person. I feel like you are too. So I would, I would wanna know who did it, what time, go after them you know right. Um, right which you want to do for lewis as like i know you were the same like as we're reading the book we're just like 
Yeah. I just want to find Lewis. I just want to, like, I just want to contact Max and be like, you need to ask more questions. He's living in, he's your, he's in your family, just so you know. Yeah. But I think it, when you were talking about that, it also kind of reminded me of this pandemic and the time that we're living through. And, you know, in the news, there's been a, a couple of these suicides lately and depression and stuff happening during this, this global pandemic. Mm -hmm. And this is a really hard time for people who, it's a hard time for everyone, but it's a really hard time, especially for people who suffer with anxiety, depression. Um, you know, it's just an important time to check in on people, check in on people who you know are alone, check in on people who are going through a hard time, check in on people who, you know, have a tendency to kind of retreat and be more introvert. Um, yeah, it just kind of reminded me of that when you're talking about that, because... Yeah. This is a hard time, and I think that people who have these tendencies don't thrive in a time mm -hmm. like this. You know, it can go the opposite way. Absolutely, and I think we too often assume people are okay, and we don't actually ask. Um, and yeah, this whole pandemic has really reminded me to check in on people. Yeah. And not just say, oh, how are you? But be like, how are you feeling? Like, how is your head? Um, I, I want everyone to know that I'm there for them. And I know it's really difficult to ask for help. So I always kind of try to offer it so that, um, cause I know even Kate says she wishes people like notice that she yeah. is okay. And I, I try, especially reading this book, it reminded me like, it is also our responsibility to check in on the people that we care about and, totally. and notice when something is not right. Sometimes we just are like, oh, they seem a little off today, but I don't want to, you know, overstep. But sometimes you do have to overstep and that's actually what, those people need and want and um the most beneficial for their safety right you also can't feel like you're responsible for everyone and like anything that happens is your fault because right. it isn't. you know i think a lot of the time when people lose people to suicide or um you know people are going through a hard time they make themselves feel very responsible for it and like i should have checked on them more i should have asked them more i should have invited them more i should have been there for them how did i not see the signs and it's i think it's impossible for someone to expect that or anticipate that um, but yeah, just kind of a good life lesson in this pandemic is just to check in on the people you love and say, how are you really? Like, is there anything I can help with? Do you want to talk about anything? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I yeah. wish more people had done for Kate in the book. Yeah. I think it's just important to know, you know, we're not doctors. We can't save people's lives. But right. what we can do is offer a shoulder. We can offer ears to listen. Um, two shoulders to cry on. Two shoulders. Um, but yeah, and I... I think talking about, you know, this idea of the trauma that eventually causes Kate to self-harm, you know, when the truth about Lewis comes out and Kate's sort of unbearable suffering is finally shared with the world, what she's been going through, mm -hmm. or at least with her inner circle, um, readers are confronted with some open questions about trauma. Um, you know, who, who do you think carries the burden of pain? Is it family? Is it friends? You know, or just... Is it, you know, you're isolated within your pain? Like, I feel like Kate, because she didn't um, come out for a long time about what had happened, I think she was, I felt very isolated in her pain. But when she, when she did come out, how do you think, you know, someone like Max feels not having seen that? Um, sorry, I realize that I'm very fidgety now in this, in this live. Oh, oh. Look at that. Look at that. I realize I'm very fidgety and I'm really hot, so that's why I'm moving so much. I know. I get really hot every time I do these. I sweat. I get, I just, I, I, you could have yeah. get really hot in these things. Yeah, you, you do. Hair up and everything. Yeah, um, I do. So, yeah, and I'm like drinking water. You're like all still and perfect and model like. And I, You've I, had I, a lot of practice. You had a lot of practice. This is my first live, so bear with me. I'm actually surprised that no called me and ruined the live yet I felt like everyone who I've never spoken I haven't spoken to in New Year's is going to decide to call me on like the 45 minutes that I was on Instagram live so I'm happy it does to happen sometimes I mean I've, yeah. I've accidentally just ended lives in the middle of them I was like what do you do if someone calls you what is there a setting on my phone so I can make sure but no one's called me so and you asked me so many great questions that I've never even thought about and I've done so many of these I'm like oh you're so professional Kimmy was like I took notes I did uh, like my lap you're sitting <laughs> up right now I have all these notes in case like I forget I'm very organized um Aww. question that you were asking me um, like when when um when the news is shared who do you think carries the burden of Kate going through something like this like at the end when they're in the movie scene and they, and they right. all really I think the heaviest burden is Max because to have been the closest person to her for so many years and to have mm -hmm. not it um has got to be uh, so 
many emotions in that theater. Also, I'm sure he felt stupid. How could he have not noticed? She's, you know, <laughs> left so many signs and little breadcrumbs. Also, the anger that it's his own blood who, you know, essentially took years from Kate's life in terms of she wasn't able to really thrive and, and prosper in those years in the way she should have and, and would have if a traumatic event like that happened. Um, so I think Max was probably hit the hardest. I think Zara knew subconsciously. I think Nicole was just kind of oblivious. And I, I think Max, it's a devastation. And, mm -hmm. a, and he probably feels a lot of guilt for having introduced her to Lewis that it happened in his house that he didn't know. Right. I and I think that was a big part of her reservations in telling Max. Yeah. Was because she didn't want him to feel like it was his fault. But she as it kind of, she kind as of it goes on, I, she's almost like, no, I want him to know that this happened. And it was partly because of him. And I think um, it is also, though, important to acknowledge that, you know, when she's talking to Zara about what happened, not the specifics of who it was, but... Zara is explaining her difficulty in relationships in the future, where she then kind of felt like the only relationship she could have included masochism. Uh, even with William, it was something that she mm -hmm. wanted to try. And um, because then you feel in control of, yeah. I guess, the violence. Um, well, what Marianne kind of did. Not that Marianne had violence. Exactly. That's what Marianne and normal people resorted to, was like sadomasochism and doing stuff that she totally didn't want to do. Absolutely. And you know, we're seen when she tried to bring it back to the bed with Connell and it just didn't translate. Exactly, and it didn't translate. And so I think I was very glad to see her relationship with Andrew be very, you know, it seemed very respectful. And while she struggled a lot in the beginning to open back up, especially to a man, um, after being so horribly abused and hurt by one, I do think it was really nice to see that she could have a normal relationship that did not include violence especially sexually and um that she slowly did begin to find herself again and and see that she deserved you know a beautiful wonderful relationship and i do yeah. i did like to see that sort of way of depicting the relationship that she had after the assault i thought it was interesting too and very ballsy of kate to tell andrew so new in their relationship right I think that men can get scared from that if only the second or ter third time that they were kind of having sex and seeing each other she dropped it on him and said you know i i was raped and it wasn't that long ago and i think mm -hmm. that a lot of men can just at that point say you know i don't want anything to do with this i don't want to take on the burden of this this is going to mm -hmm. be which is so horrible just with in which and of horrible. itself is that it's a burden that she had to suffer at the hands of a man, that that alone can be considered yeah. a burden. And I think that's another you know, reason that silence is women. And that should not be something that would ever be considered a burden on someone else. So I think it was very brave of her. I love that Andrew, it was so brave of her because that can scare a guy off in the first, not like they were dating for three years and she dropped that bomb. It's very beginning and, you know, very ballsy of her to, to mm -hmm. open him like that. And I really liked the way that he reacted. And I love that he took her for who she was and, and, was delicate yeah. when she be delicate and and knew how to treat treat her yeah and i do think it's very important because when you do i mean just in general but especially for people who have experienced very traumatic sexual experiences um to be very open about them with a partner because you do want to feel safe especially you know in um circumstances like that and so in being open i thought she did create room you know and it could have gone one of two ways but she created room for andrew to be understanding and safe and careful and delicate with her and he did that and so i was happy to see that that there was a world in which that existed yeah i, I was really happy with andrew and his character and how he yeah. how he handled it i'm very proud of andrew yeah. and kind of like the good consistent supportive partner throughout i wonder if i wonder what it had looked like if her and max hadn't been platonic mm-hmm I think it would have made. I know because part of me, when she got with Andrew, I was kind of so like, no, but she'll still end up with. I know, I thought that, and then I was on page three fifteen, and I knew I had one page left, and I there. Know. Was, but you know what? But she can I, still be in love with him. I think they are still in love with each other platonically, and that is, you know, that is still as important, if not more, because they have that stability of each other. Yeah. But I did find it interesting that it doesn't really talk about any of Max's partners at all in the book. Oh, I didn't even think about that. That is true. You know, he has his friend, Elias. Yeah, Elias. Yeah, yeah. Elias. Or Elias. 
Elias? And also, Max was getting pretty heavily into drugs, and no one's talking about the fact that, <laughs> the fact that like, Max is doing lines at 10 in the morning in his parents' house. Right. It's interesting. Max is, like, going through something that we... Yeah, and I almost think it'd be interesting to, to have this book told from Max's perspective mm -hmm. um, and kind of the struggles and the things that led him to, you know, doing drugs and down that road. And it may have just been influences. It may, you know, not be something right. as crazy and traumatic as what led um, Kate into her depression. But mm -hmm. that is something definitely to be addressed and how different people cope with different things. And it was also uh, something else that's, that I hadn't seen in a book was there was a lot of, like, principal characters. I mean, there's, like, Al Alice? Alice? Allison. No, Alice Dare. Lewis oh, Dare. Alistair, yes. Alistair. That's Lewis's dad. <laughs> Lewis's dad, and then right. there's William, and then there's Rupert, um, Uncle Rupert, and then there's... Who also struggles with addiction. Who so. also struggles with addiction, with, and then Zara, and then mm -hmm. her mom, Allison, and then Nicole, and then Shoshana, or Shona. Yeah, and there's like so. But it does. Many it does really depict the complexity of families because that is yeah. very accurate. You know, like there are so many different characters in a family that don't always add up. And so I was, it was interesting to like let all of those characters have their moment because I yeah. really do feel like they, they kind of take time on each of the characters so that you kind of understand the family dynamic and that it's not a big happy family like they appear and there is depth to their family. You're gonna read. I know I've already asked you this, but I know you're gonna read Three Women at some point. Yes. Yeah. And it's a really great book and it's interesting because what happened very subtly in this book was that it flip-flopped between all these different characters point of views in re what Red was like there was one chapter where it's Lewis's point of view of what happened that night but they never like dis distinctly describe what they're going from each character's right. different point of view. You'll see in Three Women it reminded me a little bit of that because mm -hmm. Three Women like each chapter is a different yeah. As much as I love a first person point of view I think yeah. There is something very interesting about getting everyone's perspective and you realize how different people's realities are. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that kind of reading. If you have any more books that, because it's just so interesting. It's like there's his story, her story, and the truth. You know what I mean? Right, 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 right. And so you'll see in Three Women, I like that. It's not three, it's not all these different people's perspective of the same story, but it's different stories. But I did like how in this book, she, she kind of tapped in and everyone got to tell a little bit what they were seeing from the outside, even if it was only brief in a couple pages right absolutely well i'm so happy that you did this with me i'm so happy thanks for having you me. have been like the most let me tell you out of everyone i've had on here you've been the most prepared you really? asked me questions all week you were showing me what page you were on we were keeping I'm nervous. Up. i want to be a good book club guest I want and to be let me back tell here. you you are 100 percent invited back because yeah. the preparation that you did is like I did my I makeup for away. this. I haven't done makeup in quarantine, and I had like something to look forward to. Kaya, you gave me like a reason <laughs> to, to to put myself together semi. I mean, well, I, I, that's why I do this every Friday because it's the one day a week that I actually like shower and do my makeup. That's pretty gross, but yeah. I shower well, other days, but <laughs> I am happy to be your book club guest at any time. And maybe we can do something a little lighter next time. Although this was a beautiful book, well, this yeah. was fun. You know, I do love like a light. And that's why the, the book Cammy recommended The Light We Lost to me, um, which I'm definitely getting into. And I'm very excited to have kind of like sort of a guilty pleasure read is what I've okay, kind of Okay, if it you is. do that book and you want me as your guest, I will be back again because I just cannot wait until you hit the last 50 pages. I think my mom is watching this live. Mom is in here. Hi, I miss mom. mom. Hi, mom. I made my mother read the book. She read it in like 48 hours. I Did made she love my it? mother read the book. She read it in 48 hours. I've made everyone read the book. And everyone you've been telling me to read this book, and I've been horrible because you've read all the books that I've recommended to you. And I and I promise you, promise and I you, I will have here. it. Read. I have, the next one that I'm going to do on your list is This Is What It Always Is. Oh, This Is How It Always Is. So this good. Is it, that's my next It's one. a very heavy topic as well, but a beautiful, beautiful story. It's not um, necessarily a romance, but I do think you'll love it. I didn't want to watch your live because I didn't want to um, spoil it. But uh, yeah, I'll be back for the light we lost if, we, if you want it. And yes. I love you very much. You're I love so you. You're a smart, beautiful woman. I'm so proud of you for this book club. And I really like your book recommendations. As you can tell, I'm reading all of them and you have really great taste. So I'm back whenever you'd like.
Well, I love you and thank you for inspiring women to read because that's the coolest thing anyone can do. And I'm so happy I mean, to have a friend who reads with me. Quarant- it saved my quarantine. I was not right? sure. You guys, you can be me. You can go from not being able to finish 30 pages of a book to reading 20 books in six months if you just find the subject that you like. I like drama. I like intensity. I like explosions. So that find what you like. And There's read. a book for everyone. Is There's a book for say. everyone. There's multiple books for everyone, you know? There's... I've read 20 books. I like them all. There you go. Okay. I love you. Thank you for love doing this. Time. Bye. Oh. Um, well, that was awesome. I love Cami so much. She, so wonderful. And just um, to have a friend who has interested in literature as I am has been wonderful. We've talked about so many books. So to actually be able to do a live with Cami was amazing. Um, we will be back with more book club and we have some really cool things lined up. So um, yeah, thank you guys for letting me continue doing this. This has been awesome. Um, have a wonderful weekend. Please stay safe and I will see you guys next week. <laughs>